I wanted to welcome all of you to uh, the call. We've invited all of you to what I'm uh, going to uh, characterize as an informal call today uh, because of your interest in uh, Silver Corp, and I guess three real reasons. Uh, one, we've begun uh, pouring Dore at uh, Ying, and so uh, so we've kind of uh, really evolved uh, an idea that that uh, that started a, a couple of years ago uh, to an exciting uh, juncture. Uh, Donovan, who you can see here on the call, uh, just recently spent five weeks on site at Ying and um, has some insights and, and was part of a, a trip that we hosted where we um, delved into some of the uh, the geological aspects um, at uh, Ying. And um, as well, there will be a number of other uh, catalysts and news items uh, with respect to Yang and changes and plans for the future that are going to come down the, 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 the pipe here going forward. But we thought that this was um, just given this uh, element of, of gold added to the story and the fact that gold will be increasingly a part of the story at Yang, uh, we thought it'd be good to provide some, some background uh, on this, uh, just so uh, we can put some things in context. Joined by several colleagues on the call today, uh, but really the bulk of what we're going to show you is from uh, Donovan, you can see here in Lay, uh, two members, two members of our uh, technical team here in Vancouver. And I said this is intended to be an informal uh, call, but to minimize distractions, we put everybody uh, on mute. Uh, but if you do have questions during the call, you can either write them in the chat or put your hand up and we can pause to address the questions. And uh, I will uh, apologize in advance that uh, uh, the material on this is uh, very geology and technical focused. So if we do get a lot of questions and get bogged down, we may have to sort of move on and come back to individual questions. Uh, later on in the schedule. So uh, with that, uh, what I'd like to do is bring up the and share the uh, presentation that we have. So we'll come full circle to the title of this uh, um, this presentation, Building a Gold Mine with the Night, the Yang Silver Mine uh, at a later point. Um, but uh, just from a uh, splashy beginning. We thought this was a, uh, a good way to start this, uh, this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, uh, we'll be making the usual forward-looking statements, and uh, so this uh, cautionary statement would apply. And really, the uh, reason for doing this is to, to look back and uh, try to address some of the context that's needed. And so uh, this is one example of, of a news release that we put out this past summer. Uh, this one specifically focused on um, drilling results at uh, the LNW mine within the Ying mining district. And so, uh, you know, people who've been following the company over the years have seen that, you know, we've been, uh, and knowing that we've had a fairly aggressive drill campaign uh, at Yang, we put together batches of news releases, uh, we put them out, and the, the real question is, is, well, what do they mean and what do they contribute? And, and looking back at, at this one, you know, we've sort of highlighted some of the results here in, in the highlight section. You can see 18 grams per ton gold, uh, as well as silver, uh, some very splashy copper numbers uh, on a vein that is uh, at uh, LMW. Um, uh, the LM29 vein. Uh, going down the list, you can see again uh, LM50, and this is important because we'll be touching on this this later. Um, you know, over 10 grams gold at uh, LM50 in that intercept, 2279 gold uh, at the bottom. Uh, just under 29 grams gold. So, so really, the uh, I think the 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 challenge for people to to understand is well, you know, where are these results? What are these results? And what can we expect from them? And, and I think that uh, from the production news we put out and what we're going to be putting out going forward, as well as the call today, hopefully we can address some of these questions and give you a greater understanding of what's going on. Next page, please. So I'm going to let Donovan uh, speak mainly to this slide, um, but it's important and there's, I have it sort of as a quote and maybe it's paraphrased, uh, someone actually on this call a few years back when I began discussing the kind of results that we were having commented and sort of said, well, I always thought it was very interesting uh, that Silver Corp has been such a successful company um, mining silver, lead and zinc. 
um, and, and doing it so profitably while operating with what's you know mainly known as a gold mining district. And so, uh, you know, interesting comment, but, you know, I'll turn over to Donovan to kind of speak to that uh, aspect here, uh, sort of looking at a broader, you know, geology picture of where Yang is. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lon. Um, as Lon introduced, I'm Donovan Pino. I'm a geologist with Silver Coat Metals, uh, working in the technical and corporate development team. And uh, what we're looking at here is essentially just a geological map of the southern portion of the North China Craton. And what I highlight today is the, the position of the Ying Mining District. And as you can see from the legend, um, those are silver lead zinc deposits. And we've always been primarily focused on those deposits as a uh, silver producing company. And as Lon alluded to previously, uh, we've started intersecting some really good uh, gold grades and draw holes. And as we'll show you in a bit, also some underground development. And then we thought, hang on a bit, you know, what's, what's really happening in the bigger picture? And if you just take a step back and you look on a regional to a district scale, you actually realize that you have this very small, well, not small, but large uh, soil deposit within predominantly a, a gold rich district. And as you can see from the, the maps, we have very prominent gold mineralization and deposits towards the east of the Ying district and also towards the uh, northwest in rocks of a similar age to those that host the Ying uh, silver lead zinc deposits. So from a geological perspective and a regional district perspective, you can see it's a very well mineralized, prolific uh, gold district with subordinate amounts of silver, albeit very high grade. And also towards the east, um, lots of molybdenum deposits showing up, which hints at large scale porphyries being developed in the district as well. So that bodes well for future gold um, prospects within the Ying district as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll let Donovan uh, speak to this slide in terms of the, the explanation, but a lot of this work really came out to uh, what was a, a very fortuitous discovery. And you can see there at the bottom of that diagram, um, uh, which we're calling a you know, ramp discovery. And that occurred in May of 2020. Uh, we've, uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, development over the years and looking at ways to optimize the movement of uh, people and materials. Uh, within the mine, that's in, that's entailed uh, development of uh, some fairly extensive ramp systems, and it was a uh, it was a visit of one of these ramp systems uh, that had been developed uh, that cut across uh, a very interesting observation uh, in the in the wall of the ramp, and it was really kind of the catalyst to uh, to this whole sort of surprise. And um, Donovan, I guess, do you want to sort of jump in there and speak to what we believe is the case? Sure. So as the slide points out, LMW newly discovered gold and gold copper mineralization. So the gold story for Silver Corp really begins at LMW mine, because as Lon pointed out, that's where the first discovery was made. And that's also what the bulk of this presentation will focus on is LMW mine. So in early 2020, um, while completing underground development, uh, a primary ramp access development, they intersected this very flashy um, chocolate bar at Rich Vein, which we then sampled and determined, you know, it, it has some gold grade. So then we took a step back and had a look at um, LMW mine as a whole. And we actually realized that, wait a minute, there's more of these very high grade gold intercepts in historic holes. And that led to the identification <coughs> of uh, primarily two sets of vein structures. Uh, the first being early low angle uh, north dipping structures, which are very uh, copper and gold rich. And, We've identified a few of these structures and named them LM21, 22, 26, 28, and 53. But there's a few more in the mix that we haven't really figured out and understand that well yet. And then there's a secondary set of uh, gold structures which dip to the south, which are primarily gold dominant with very little copper and silver in them. So distinctly two sets of gold bearing structures and mineralization events um, at LMW mine have been identified. Uh, these structures are often very well developed and can be traced along strike and dip um, for extensive uh, distances, but we've noticed that the quartz vein development and the mineralization is uh, rather variable, not in terms of grade disappearing completely, but just some variability in terms of high grade and low grade. Um, what's interesting is the reason primarily that we've always missed these uh, flat low angle uh, gold bearing structures is as you can see from the diagram at the bottom is the primary access development for the silver lead zinc veins, which are high angle come in horizontally. And as luck would have it geologically, we've always just been underneath or above these flat uh, gold bearing structures. So we haven't really exposed them in the underground development. But as Lon pointed out, 
we expose one of those in the ramp development. And another thing that happens is because these um, gold and copper gold veins are older than the silver lead zinc veins, they're often filtered and displaced along the vertical silver lead zinc veins, which made exploration for them pretty difficult in the past. And also we didn't realize that these structures also extensively developed across the LMW mining area. Yeah, I'll just speak to this slide because I, I think from an investor standpoint and reviewing our, our presentation, you know, we've always been known for doing extensive exploration at uh, Gang and uh, GC, uh, drilling and tunneling. And you can see, though, that uh, this big uptick that uh, took place starting in 2020 and, and you know, people familiar with the company uh, sort of understand that, that our drilling has been focused on near mine resource expansion, uh, converting and upgrading resources to reserves, uh, following up on historical intercepts of note. And, and I'll say to that, that's either uh, particularly high grade areas uh, where we think we can get uh, good grade material or areas that, um, um, that are near existing infrastructure, you know, to address, uh, you know, cost management. Um, but really it's the number four, which is, is what really caused this uh, big uptick uh, in drilling to start uh, in 2020. And, and again, the reason why we're uh, we're here chatting today. So what do we have here is just a, a few summary tables um, showing the highlights of some of these gold veins. And the ones listed here um, are receiving the, the primary focus at the moment in terms of exploration drilling and also underground development and extraction. Um, the primary vein being exploited currently uh, is Alent 50, which we'll get to in a second. And as you can see from the tables um, shown here, these are just some highlight in the steps from both drill holes and underground chip sampling. The majority of these being underground chip sampling. And you can see exceptional um, gold grades, you know, in excess of 50 grams a ton over almost a meter. Um, the thickness of these veins are fairly consistent throughout the, the area that we've seen so far. So not too much variability in thickness. Um, and as you can see, LM50, very high grade, up to almost 60 grams a ton. And we filtered this out on, you know, just above eight grams a ton. So there's way more data to show that these are just some really exceptional uh, results that are fairly consistent within the panels being mined at LM50 currently. And towards the bottom on the right-hand side table um, is LM52, another vein that we'll show you in a second. And as you can see, also very consistent gold mineralization, uh, very fairly consistent uh, thicknesses comparative to LM50. And what's interesting about this particular vein, as I pointed out, we have the development of the gold only veins and these two are those as you can see in the copper uh, the copper grades are fairly negligible so very distinctive gold only structures the next set of veins um, these refer to the the north dipping uh, copper gold veins um, these are primarily being exploited in the north of lmw mine uh, particularly the lm22 vein and as you can see again from the chip sampling and drill hole data very high grade, but also to note are the very high copper grades. So a double bang for your buck on these veins. And there's actually more of these copper gold veins um, identified at present at LMW mine. Very high grade and very consistent gold um, across these structures as well. As you can see on the right hand side, LM26, which is a similar structure, copper gold, very consistent uh, with and also very consistent gold and copper grades. So after you know identifying that there's some gold in the area, we, we had to take a step back in terms of the geological understanding of the district. And we did some digging, had a look at a few reports and some uh, papers published. And we actually realized, you know, these rocks are essentially very old of and age rocks. Um, they've been part of multiple deformation and geological events over history. And three distinct mineralization periods have been identified in literature. Uh, the first being the earliest is the D1 event, which had no mineralization, but getting to the good stuff, the D3 um, deformation event occurred in the, the late Triassic, uh, approximately 286 million years ago. And we've had, or but we, um, academics and also industry professionals have concluded that this specific age of mineralization can be tied into the low angle copper gold veins specifically. But interestingly enough, as I mentioned, we've also identified these gold only veins, which presently, um, in literature hasn't been tied to any specific deformation event, uh, but that has been age dated at around 230 million years, which is in the Jurassic. So you can argue the fact that it might have formed part of the same structural deformation event, the D3, 
which may have been a long protracted um, event over time. But then coming to the youngest mineralization event in the region is the one that we've always been focused on. And that occurred in the D5, D6 um, deformation event, which I'll show you diagrammatically in a second. And this event was responsible for the high angle silver lead zinc structures, plus minus a bit of copper and gold that we've been exploiting at Ying. So the question looms, you know, why haven't we paid much attention to the gold in the past? Well, first off, we didn't know that there might be extensive gold mineralization within the region. Um, the historical focus has always been on the high angle, you know, silver lead zinc structures. Um, these structures outcrop on surface, so it made it very easy to find them, trace them across the region and develop mines from them. Um, the early discovery and mine development was built around these high angle structures containing the silver and, and lead. The underground access development has always prioritized exploitation of high angle structures. As I pointed out earlier, the orientation of these flat, uh, low angle structures make it difficult to intersect in the development that we have. And then also previously, the drill holes were designed for high angle structures. And based on the drilling angle, they were very unlikely to intersect these low angle gold bearing structures. So just a bit diagrammatically, um, looking back at the past, as I mentioned, the D3 deformation event in literature, it's well pointed out that in the district, um, the D3 deformation event is linked to these uh, low angle flatline copper gold structures, as you can see. And that was primarily caused due to a compressive tectonic event, uh, creating low angle thrust structures along which these copper gold uh, quartz veins uh, were emplaced along. So, you know, historically in, in literature, these structures are there and lo and behold, we found them at Yang and particularly at LMW mine. Um, after that, we had the D4 event, uh, which occurred due to a shift in the compressive direction to a more northwest, uh, southeast direction. And this sort of started the structural preparation for the host structures for these high angle silver lead sink veins uh, that we're currently exploiting. So this was again, a very long protracted event. Um, a sinister sense of shear created these uh, voids and then progressed into D5 where we had the emplacement of what is assumed to be um, deep level porphyry systems, intrusions. And these intrusions were responsible for the emplacement of, first off in the D5 deformation event, the early stages of silver lead zinc mineralization, followed by a extensional event that created even more space in these structures, which was responsible for the mineralization or the main stage of mineralization for the silver lead zinc veins that we're seeing within the Ying district. So if you just step back tectonically, you know, the structural history of the region, first off, it's very favorable for the formation of these low angle structures, as you can see in the diagrams. And then also just the emplacement of these copper gold veins have been proven in similar deposits uh, within the district as well. So getting to an example of what these uh, veins actually look like, the first one that I want to discuss is um, LM22. This is a north-northwest dipping copper gold vein. And what's very distinctive about these veins is um, the high charcoal pyrite association with the gold. Very high sulfide content. Um, these veins occur along um, flat dipping or flat dipping fault planes. Uh, they're well defined structurally across the region. We can trace them extensively from mappings and also drill holes that we just started to link up. So this is the first set of veins developed at LMW mine, the Copper Gold Association. And the second ones are the south dipping uh, gold only veins. Uh, the one primarily being exploited and being studied currently is the LM50 vein. Uh, all of these structures occur within the host nice rock, similar to the silver lead zinc veins. These are early south dipping low angle fault structures um, that occur along shear structures with prominent alteration hosted within the nice. Um, once you know what to look for, these structures are fairly easy to identify, but to the untrained eye, they're very inconspicuous. Uh, also part of the reason why in the past they, they might have been missed because they don't stand out as well as the charcoal pyrite uh, rich veins. You can see from the picture there, you know, apart from a few quartz veins and some alteration, it looks fairly bland, but sample it and you get exceptionally high gold grades. The structure is also very well developed as I'll show you in a bit in some of the cross sections and plans. Uh, this is one of the main gold structures developed at LMW mine that we're currently targeting for exploration and also development. So what does this data look like? As we've mentioned in the past, we've had numerous intersections of uh, you know, noticeable gold grains within the draw holes at LMW mine. 
and also most recently in underground chip sampling. So taking a step back and just viewing the data plot as a whole, this is a north-south section uh, looking towards the east of the entire LMW mine. Um, the section width is 300 meters looking into the page and 200 meters coming out of the screen as well. So a 500 meter wide cross section. And you can see, you know, initially the data looks fairly jumbled, but once you understand the orientation of the structures, you can start to tie up these high grade uh, drill hole intercepts and also chip sampling. And starting from the top left hand corner, the first vein I showed you, LMW, is one of these early north dipping veins, well defined structural plane, moving down in elevation. You can see these are conjugate sets forming in parallel as you go uh, deeper in the mine. Uh, we've recently discovered LM21 in the ramp development. That's actually the discovery vein that was made. Um, LM26, a bit deeper, is one of the veins currently being developed. And then going to the main structure is LM50, which is one of the south dipping veins. You can see all those samples, um, very high data density. That's because it's currently being mined. Uh, and we have a lot of information from chip sampling. And then also just on the opposite end of the fault is a vein that we refer to as LM50 that's recently been discovered and developed in the eastern part of the mine. But based on the geological characteristics, um, the grade, the width, the alteration, the structural uh, characteristics of this vein, we firmly believe that this is the same structure as LM50 that's just been offset on LM7, which is a silver lead zinc uh, vein. So you can see the, the data currently looks a bit jumbled, but as we're building the puzzle, we're identifying very prominent structures, you know, across the mine for both the silver, uh, not the silver, the, the copper gold veins and also the gold only veins. So we'll quickly switch over to Micromine just to give you a visual representation in 3D of what these, uh, some of these structures look like. And also just from a spatial perspective where these structures are. Yeah, and I'll just give Donovan a chance to catch his breath and just uh, highlight. You know, you can see th this is the the uh, the satellite overlay and as well the micromine overlay to the four mining permits. Uh, and you can see the uh, the mines that are familiar uh, to everyone on this call. Um, the seven mines. Uh, there's some other areas that are also uh, labeled with uh, with the letters that represents uh, other uh, portals and other access points and office infrastructure. Uh, but you can see there uh, just generally where uh, the different mines are located on the permits. And of course, we're speaking about LMW. So that's in the uh, lower uh, right hand corner. And the uh, the yellow uh, that is shown here are the what I'll call the existing substantial ramp development that we have. Uh, not all the underground development, but the substantial, the substantial uh, decline ramps uh, to get uh, access. And uh, the, the the turquoise areas are other ramps that are uh, planned uh, to be developed here in the mines. So if we just zoom in a bit more on LMW, which was the focus of um, this presentation and also where the bulk of the work over the last five weeks have occurred. Um, this is the, the underground development for primarily the silver lead zinc um, structures at LMW mine. And as you can see, extensive infrastructure um, across multiple levels, but ranging vertically. And if we also just have a look at the amount of drill holes that have been completed at LMW, there's a vast amount of information. Um, so making sense of, you know, these gold intercepts in a historically silver focused environment has created some questions. But as we've begun to understand, you know, these structures from underground developments and also tying up boreholes and understanding what these structures look like. We've been able to separate some of the noise out of, you know, the silver lead zinc focused draw holes versus the, the gold mineralization at LMW mine. And as you can see from the, the colors that have just popped up, these are the gold intercepts from both draw holes as well as underground developments at LMW mine. And this big cluster of data is the area that I referred to um, as LM50. And to get rid of some of the noise, we're just going to do some flipping. So what we're looking at now is a plan view at the 800 meter elevation um, at LMW mine, focused at the LM50 vein. And as you can see from the data, it's fairly dense and the legend as well. You know, we filter this data at one gram a ton. So any samples that have, you know, assayed less than one gram a ton has been excluded. And as you can see, the data density is fairly high, which is encouraging because you know, that just indicates that overall the, the grade is fairly consistent and rather good for, for gold mineralization at LM50. 
So just to give you a visual representation of what these structures look like in a 3D environment, um, we've created a very simple plane um, of the LM50 vein in this area that's being mined currently. And as I mentioned, most of the, the focus for these gold veins is on this vein currently because it lies within infrastructure. It's very easy, easily accessible. And the gold grades are also very good for you know, small scale test mining presently. So we have some good data points to sort of understand what the structure looks like currently. And what we'll do now is we'll rotate from a, a plan view looking down at the body to a up the view of LM50 looking from south to north. And you can see from that, from the data density and also the structure that we modeled, it's a very flat planet tabular ore body. So what this means is, you know, there's vast expansion potential for these kinds of structures, not only along strike, but down dip and up dip as well. And if we just have a look on the right, you can see a cluster of very good grades as well, fairly high data density. And that is the LM50 vein that I alluded to previously. Here. 52, um, and as you can see, looking at an up dip section of LM50 and essentially LM52 as well, this structure continues towards the east. And from the data density, you can see there's hardly any draw holes being drilled in that area. But we mapped the structures, both of them, and we built planes and projected their positions, and they link up perfectly across the mining area. So one of the big target areas is to infill that gap and to, to prove, not, not the existence because we know it's there, but to prove the the great continuation of the structure within that gap area. And that's also very positive for us because it currently lies within infrastructure. So it's easily accessible and easily exploitable from a mining perspective as well. So you can see from this very small area, the data density that we have in comparison to the overall footprint of LMW mine. We've only recently exploited and unlocked a very small portion of LM50, which is one of our main gold targets. And we firmly believe that, you know, these structures are regionally, or not regionally developed, but developed extensively across the entire mine. As I showed you from that previous section with all the draw holes, it's just a matter of confirming the, the extension and the, the gold grade continuity. The cluster on the top left-hand corner towards the Northwest, uh, that's a very small footprint area. And that is the LM22 vein that I showed uh, first, the one that is very uh, rich in charcoal pyrite and uh, very high copper grades and also very high gold grades. And as you can see from the limited sampling and small scale mining that's been completed, the grades are rather good. I mean, there's grades of 46.5 grams a ton, 182.9 grams a ton. And this occurs over a, a width of between 60 to up to a meter thick. So substantial mining widths and at those grades, you don't need a lot of tons to produce a lot of ounces. So the upside to this area is, as you can see, a very small footprint of LM22, a very high grade. But if you look to the north of the, the mining development, there's hardly any drill hole data. There's hardly any access development. So that just shows the the northward and up dip, uh, down, uh, my apologies, down dip expansion potential of LM22. And this will also be one of the the near-term target areas for, for gold vein identification and expansion. Sure. So that's just a quick uh, summary of what these structures look like in the 3D environments. And as you can see from the plane that we built, it's very flat, um, very promising down dip and strike extension. So flipping back to, to this cross section of the entire mine and the structures, as I mentioned, you can see LM50 um, has been mined on some limited scale. But from the understanding of the structure and also how um, it projects up dip and along strike, you can see towards the north along LM50, there's a series of draw holes that have intersected gold grades that lie perfectly along the plane of LM50. So that's the first area of targeted exploration for LM50 and potential expansion that looks very uh, promising. LM22 as well, just towards the left, we've identified a fault in the, in the stoke faces um, that we've modeled and we've actually projected the extension of LM22 within the footwall block of this area, uh, which will be a near-term near exploration target as well. Um, there's one draw hole that we've seen. The, the vein is there. We just need to drill it more. Um, down a little bit deeper, LM21, no real development currently. It's only been intersected within the ramp declines, 
but from the drill hole data up there from the vein structure, you can see 19.7, 5.6 grams a ton. The drill holes tie up very well with the structure that's been mapped in the development. Um, a little bit deeper, looking at Alum 26, this is also a copper gold vein that's being mined uh, on a small scale at Alum W mine. We projected the position of the known vein up dip to higher levels. We went and had a look, as you can see, those blue symbols are mapping symbols, and we actually managed to, to find um, in the development Alum 26 vein exactly where we projected the data. So there's roughly about 100 meters up dip that we need to draw and confirm the extent of the structure and the, uh, the gold mineralization within infrastructure as well. And then, as I mentioned, towards the, the south or uh, towards Alum 52 vein, we're currently developing the, the structure along strike. But as I pointed out in the plan section and also looking up there from Alum 50, there's a huge gap in the data in that area that connects the two structures. So that's also a main focus area for us. And then towards the right-hand side, Alum 53, Another structure that we recently intersected in decline development, uh, very well mineralized up to 20 grams a ton in the early underground chip sampling. And also just having a look at some drill hole data in the region, um, the, the structure ties up, down dip and up dip from the known intersection on level. And then just as a bit of a uh, geo fantasy, because we always like to generate new targets. As you can see at the bottom, close to the scale, there's a great intercept in a draw hole, 8.6 grams a ton, and down dip towards the north, 8.1 grams a ton. And lo and behold, if you just copy paste the orientation of you know, that imaginary line, it ties up perfectly well with the structures like LM26, LM21, LM22. So this just shows that there's considerable data gaps that we can still exploit, and there's a multitude of vein structures that we still uh, need to identify at LMW mine. So just to give a visual representation, uh, we had a look at LM50 in Micromine quickly. And as you can see from this, a very small footprint area, mine on a limited scale, the underground chip sampling and drill hole results have uh, returned very good gold grades. Um, and as you can see, the, the blue shading there is the, the near, near term expansion um, that we'll target for LM50 that lies within infrastructure at LMW mine. And please don't be put off by the gray draw holes that show that there's no gold grain. These are actually draw holes that were targeted for the silver lead zinc structures and not particularly the gold structures. But you can see some spots showing up, the greens and the yellows and the blues and the reds and purples. Um, these are actually draw holes that we've confirmed have drawn into Alum 50 and the gold veins. So you can see there's significant uh, up dip expansion potential towards the north as well as a long strike towards the northeast and southeast currently. Then intersecting a fault zone towards the southwest, we know that this is likely the same structure that has been labeled as LM52. And from the data gap as well, you can again see very high probability of expansion potential towards the northeast, the north, um, a long strike and dip. And what we've done from LM52 is on level at 750, 100 meters elevation. We've projected a plane down to 700 meter elevation, and we went and we sampled um, the position of the projected structure on level and its recent return grades of 1.3 grams a ton. So that just proves the down dip extension um, of the structure. And also, if you just lay it inside that little draw hole over there, that draw hole lies exactly on the plane that was projected and also came back at uh, just below three grams a ton. So that just proves the, the you know, the, the development of these structures across the mining area. We just haven't drilled them properly and we just haven't developed them properly, but the structures are there. Similarly to LM22, very small footprint. Um, again, don't be put off by the drill hole intercepts that show less than five grams a ton. <clears throat> these are holes that have been targeted for the vertical high angle silver lead zinc structures. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we intersected a fault in the head of the panels um, for LM22. We projected the position of the structure in the football block of uh, the fault. And there's one draw hole that we've highlighted there. As I mentioned, the key characteristic of the LM22 vein, uh, and particularly these north dipping veins, is the high charcoal pyrite and copper content. And as you can see from that draw hole, uh, it returns 3.5% copper. And we had a look at the, the core photos, the structure is there. So it is continuing towards the north, which again, just you know, emphasizes the, 
the expansion potential of these structures towards the north and also a long strike towards the east and west. And in this case, also towards the south, because we have intersected on a limited scale in development, uh, the same structure, but there's been no work done towards the south. Oh, there's one draw, sorry, yes. 3.5 grams per ton gold, 3% copper. So that just proves, you know, the, the down dip extension and up dip extension of, of this particular structure as well, which will form um, the basis for the near term exploration targeting because of the high grade nature of these structures. So in conclusion, what's the future gold potential and the next steps? So for LMW mine particularly, you know, we've now discovered a number of these north and south dipping vein structures, and they've displayed preliminary, you know, strike and the potential um, that's open in all directions along these structures. And I just put in a very um, quick diagram on the right-hand side there, showing LM50 vein and where it's been mined. That high data density is where it's currently being mined um, from 800 level down towards 750 level. You can see down dip uh, on the dashed lines, there's been a few holes drilled high grade, 10.8 grams a ton, 22 grams a ton. But further south towards the cutoff structure that we know exists, there's been no drill holes planned. So the near-term exploration um, strategy for LMW mine, as it relates to these gold bearing structures, is to utilize um, existing drilling platforms and to test and prove the extension of these gold structures. And the good thing, as I pointed out below, these structures currently lie within infrastructure. So accessing them and mining them quickly is not really a problem because you know, if you can just prove the low points and where these structures are, quick access development within infrastructure and you can get on the gold very quickly and very efficiently at a reduced cost because there's no you know, excessive development costs associated with reaching these structures. And then the big thing moving forward is just to consolidate these vein structures at LMW mine. As I showed you in the cross section, there's a vast amount of gold intercepts, very high grade. We just need to understand where these structures lie <clears throat> within the mining space and how we can exploit and draw them and develop them. And the good news is the gold story doesn't just stop at LMW mine. Uh, recently, we've we've had a look at TLP mine as well, which is very close to, to LMW. And we've assessed some of the, the drill core and had a look at the drill hole intercepts. And there's early signs of similar gold uh, bearing structures, you know, similar to what exists at LMW mine. And that's just a, a small example of a drill hole that was drilled at the neighboring TLP mine. Um, the core was resampled and sampled, and the core recovery is very poor. But the overall intercept was um, just below 15 grams a ton over one meter. And having a look at the core itself, it shows a very low angle intercept, which confirms that it's a low angle structure at the mine. But also what's very important here is the distinctive potassium alteration within the core. And that is very unique to what we're seeing within the LM50 vein at uh, LMW mine. So very similar geological features and alteration characteristics, which shows that these structures are potentially developed you know, across multiple mines with very similar gold grades and very similar geological characteristics. And then we also started doing some preliminary work at HPG. As we highlight today, HPG is a bit of a mystery. Um, historically, it's produced uh, most of the gold for Silver Corp. Most of the gold being produced by our company is uh, comes from the HPG mine. And it's fairly unique in the sense that it has significantly higher gold uh, to silver ratios compared to the other mines within the district. And that begs the question, you know, is the HPG mineralization related to a different source or is it a function of a thermal gradient within the hydrothermal system? Um, then also interestingly, there's a, a paper published in 2023, um, just a couple of months back where the the academics actually ran test programs where they used actual data uh, from mine sites and also um, ran simulations on AI technology to do um, AI and algorithm driven exploration targeting. And as you can see from the diagram that's from the paper, HPG just lights up as this huge, huge gold potential target. Granted it's from actual data um, from HPG, which does show high grade gold grades, but also from the uh, predictive um, exploration tool from, from this new study. So HPG is a very significant gold target for us moving forward, not only because of the, the gold associated within the solar structures, but also to look at some structures like um, H16 and H17 at, H, at HPG that show signs of being gold only structures with no associated silver or copper. 
So that's a big upside potential at HPG uh, specifically in terms of Silver Corp's gold story moving forward. Then in terms of the other mines, uh, referring to SGX, LME, um, DCG, all those mines, um, our gold story has only just started. And as you've, as you've seen from the, the vast amount of drill holes that have been completed, we have so much data to sift through. And you know, in terms of the gold potential at the other mines, at this stage, it's a bit too early to conclude. But we have started the process of you know, reviewing the sampling data uh, from these drill holes, looking at the core and identifying similar structures and uh, gold structure patterns at the other mines within the Ying district. So I just wanted to uh, jump back in here and basically uh, wrap up by uh, taking things full circle and uh, also following up on uh, Donovan's comment. Um, you know, it, it, interesting looking back at uh, some previous uh, disclosure we had in our uh, in our investor presentation. You know, first off, making new new discoveries, finding gold deposits in silver mines. Uh, as you noted from the, the the title of this presentation, uh, I think we've developed that and advanced that to building gold mines within a silver mine. So so uh, we've evolved that story. And uh, speaking specifically to some of the mysteries at uh, HPG. Uh, we had uh, flagged that some of the drilling at HPG had discovered a new, uh, new, new zone, a different type of zone. And you can see the grades in what we're calling this uh, breccia uh, area um, to that gold-silver ratio element. You know, had a higher gold relative to the silver um, in, in terms of numbers. You know, these were in our presentation. We we're excited about what they could bring. Hard to wrap any context around them. Uh, but ultimately, you can see from the picture on the right, uh, when we uh, just had our recent visit, uh, this actual area is now being mined um, uh, and using a different mining method in terms of long haul stoping to uh, tackle this, this broader zone area within HPG. So I think just evidence of the fact that these uh, discoveries are being developed, advanced, incorporated into the mine plan and are uh, uh, you know, being brought forward in terms of production. And so we're optimistic that these other zones that we're just still very early on in the early days in terms of the, the production from uh, LM50, um, but with more exploration, more development, you know, this is only going to be a growing story, you know, within this uh, silver mining operation. And uh, with that, we'll jump to the last slide and see if uh, we have a few minutes for any questions. Hi, Lon and Donovan. This is uh, Gabriel from Echelon. Um, uh, obviously, lots of geological information to digest. Um, uh, really, I, I was actually wondering, uh, the, uh, I believe this was being recorded. Is there any chance that we can get a, um, a copy of this so that we can kind of go over it again and uh, more or less, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess try to make a little bit more, uh, make a little bit more sense of it uh, so that we can then circle back with you guys? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll 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 clean this up. Uh, there's a few edits that we want to make to it. We'll clean this up and we'll get it uh, both uh, distributed to you guys and uh, aim to uh, put it out on our uh, our website as some some additional Yang geological background. Okay. And also, in you know, in future, if you want to reach out to me and have a separate discussion on the geology in the region, please happy to have a discussion. Just reach out. We can set up a time. Great. Right, thank you very much. Do you guys hear me? Yes. So I just wanted to verify: Have you got? Have you guys done some meth testing for the copper at the these uh, the LM50 vein yet? What kind of recoveries could you expect? Well, so, there, there is. Uh, do you want to go ahead, Don? Go ahead. Sorry, uh, the LM50 vein uh, contains very little copper. It's the the gold only only structure. Uh, the copper is more associated with the north dipping structures like LM22, LM21. Sure. But go ahead, Lon. Yeah, and, and from a metallurgy standpoint, uh, we have had and we've continued to produce uh, copper as a byproduct in our lead concentrate. Uh, obviously, the uh, the uh, terms and payability of that are uh, are, are not the greatest, uh, but we are making uh, money on that uh, as part of a byproduct. The, the question going forward here will be the cost benefit trade off to uh, separating that copper out um, into a separate product or not. Yes, 
And I assume more, I mean, you will be studying this more closely in the coming year when you get more information. Because, I mean, if you're, if you're starting to switch over to more significant volumes that's copper concentrated, you want to optimize for that, I assume. Yeah, I mean, right now the the copper is typically reporting to the lead concentrate, and yep. um, and and we are being uh, paid for the contained copper in the lead concentrate. Uh, the the terms of it aren't the aren't necessarily the greatest, but what we have to do is look at uh, the sort of the, the cost benefit trade off of whether or not we separate out and produce a copper concentrate, um, which would then obviously go to uh, to a, a different, uh, you know, to a different customer and be subject to different payment terms. But of course, you have to balance the overall metallurgy and look at, well, where's the silver reporting? Where is the lead reporting? Uh, if you get lead in a copper concentrate, you, you know, you won't get anything for that. So we, we have to look at that. And there's going to be definitely some more testing going forward and related to that. And then I would like to ask about, you know, just the, just the nature of the structure of these veins. Do you think that it would be more, I mean, would it be easier to pull out more ore in a low dipping vein, generally speaking, to kind of meet the increased throughput post-expansion at Yang? Do you think that's a, an advantage for you guys? Could you, could you comment on that? Uh, I think there's a lot to address in that, unpacking that question, just because of the, the fact that, you know, we are developing um, better underground access to be bringing in uh, larger uh, equipment and looking at increasing mechanization. Um, some of those areas, you know, as Donovan pointed out, uh, have access to them. Uh, whether there's existing silver lead zinc mining going on, you know, we'll have to obviously uh, select and optimize and schedule appropriately. Uh, they are narrow uh, zones, so it's not as though, uh, for the most part, we're, we're looking at big bulk tonnage, but I will call it, you know, incremental tonnage that we can add to the mix and obviously is diversifying our metal stream and our uh, revenue base. Yeah, and it's also ramping up to bigger production volumes from these gold structures because it's a bit of a, a step change for the mining guys as well, going from a receiving method focused on vertical structures to now switching to something that's flat and adopting a breast sloping um, extraction method. So there's ongoing training and I come from a tabular or body mining background. I'm a Vitz gold geologist uh, with Anglo Gold Ashanti and I'm very familiar with the, the breast sloping method that needs to be employed for the extraction of these uh, flat dipping veins. And from what I've seen, the guys have done a very good initial job you know, at developing them correctly and also mining them correctly and getting the ore out correctly. So there's there's large there's some good potential moving forward if we can scale up in terms of the amount of uh, race lines we can develop on these structures, and then also from the volumes we can generate from the breast stoping. Um, the question comes in, you know, can we handle the additional volumes created from this? And as Lon pointed out, you know, we're ramping up our, our tunnel sizes and our infrastructure to actually accommodate a higher tonnage throughput, not only from the traditional silver lead zinc uh, mining but also from the anticipated increase in production volumes from these gold structures as well. So it won't be a, a instantaneous step change. It will be a gradual uptick in uh, production volumes from these structures as we find more of them, as we develop more of them, as we perfect the mining technique on them. Sure. Uh, and then one of these ballpark questions that are always uncomfortable, I guess, but say age two, end of age two next year, uh, what kind of tonnage do you kind of Primary, like preliminarily target to pull out of the, I guess it mainly LM fifty vein. Vein. Yeah, it's too, like too early couple, to say. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's too early. Like, like we haven't given uh, our, our next year's guidance. That's going to come up here at the end of the year. Um, but with the work that's being done uh, on all fronts uh, related to this, uh, and of course we you know we did provide guidance uh, last year on the gold zones. Um, so I would imagine that we'll be in an even better position, uh, given the work that's been done this year to, uh, to get that, but we're not, you know, we're not in a position to do that now. And, and then just briefly, last question, do, do you expect to be able to incorporate a lot of, um, this new information into the next mineral resource update or will this have to be included in a later update? Yes. I mean, obviously it will be continually updated, but. Yes. Yeah. And our intention is to do, uh, updated technical reports. Uh, on both uh, Ying and GC based on all the exploration work up to the end of this year. Uh, the, the, the first and easiest element to answer is yes, a reserve resource update. Um, and then to the extent that we can 
uh, provide you know more details uh, in terms of life of mine models for production. Uh, that's what we're hoping to be able to do uh, with a report targeted for completion sort of May timeframe is the, uh, the objective. Excellent. Well, great presentation. Thanks. Thanks for John. Thank you.